So just settling into our meditation posture. Inviting a sense of relaxation as much as possible in the body and the mind. And maybe as we begin the meditation time, bringing to mind our own goodness in whatever way is accessible for us to reflect on that. It could be as simple as our intention in showing up to meditate, being interested in the mind, the heart, could be our efforts in our life to practice kindness, to avoid causing harm in all the different areas of our life. So finding some way to reflect on our own goodness, our own lovability, and just letting that in. Letting in that truth that we care about this heart, this mind and body, and recognizing and cultivating that attitude of goodwill towards ourself in a really simple way. We can express that just by encouraging the mind and the body to relax, inviting relaxation. Inviting appreciation for ourselves. And we can express that with words, with images, remembering aspects of our life that maybe bring up this goodwill or appreciation, but it can also be expressed just with a feeling in the heart, just the feeling of goodwill towards ourselves. the kind of acceptance of ourselves as we are here and now in this moment, that's an expression of goodwill, not imposing expectations and judgments, letting the mind and body be as they are. and appreciating the goodness that's here, the intention to be mindful, the interest in developing the mind and heart in a positive direction. See if you can find something to celebrate, to appreciate about yourself 
and then let that be a seed for an attitude of goodwill. as if we're sitting in a field of goodwill or being witnessed, being seen with the eyes of goodwill. What does that feel like, the moments in our life when someone has looked at us with goodwill, with unconditional positive regard, remembering what that feels like in the body and the heart and mind and letting that in. Nothing we need to do, no one we need to be in order to receive that goodwill, like the rays of the sun, a free gift. Once there's some connection with that feeling of goodwill, the attitude of goodwill, then that can become the focus of the attention. Maybe we feel some warmth in the heart center, middle of the chest, or just some sense of lightness throughout the body. Or maybe it's more of a mental phenomenon just a happiness, the happiness of goodwill, of wishing well, of appreciating. But that very feeling, that very attitude can become the focus, the theme of the meditation, letting it expand if it wishes, letting it fill the space of the mind and body just that simple well-wishing, appreciating, blessing, you could say, towards ourself. And if it's difficult to touch into this goodwill towards ourselves, we can remember that this heart has the capacity to wish well, to appreciate others. So we could bring to mind some being, could be an animal or a, a niece or nephew,
someone that's easy to feel goodwill towards and let that remind us of the goodness of our own heart, that ability to wish well, to extend ourselves And touching into that, we can appreciate that capacity. And again, allow that to be known, to be recognized, to be felt, and perhaps to expand, to be felt more fully throughout the mind and body. So using our creativity, we'll continue in silence for some time and finding your own way to connect with this capacity of the heart to be good, to wish well, to care, to appreciate, connecting with that, maybe using image, an image or a phrase. And at times, maybe if the Connection is strong, letting go of a phrase or image and simply abiding in that emotion, that attitude of goodwill without needing it to to do anything. But if it does wish to expand, then making the space for that, for it to be felt and fill as much of the space of the mind and heart as it will.
So in metta meditation, the primary object is this capacity of the heart to be good, to wish well. And the practice is to keep remembering this theme, connecting with it and sustaining attention there. that wishes well, that has no ill will towards ourselves, towards others. As if we're looking at ourselves, looking at the world, looking at others with the eyes of goodwill, of kindness. What would that be like? What would that feel like? And we start where it's most immediate with our own experience of the body and mind, practicing non-ill will, patience, compassion, appreciation, equanimity with the changing conditions here and now. this capacity of the heart to care and to connect with our own experience without needing to control or judge the experience. Allowing it to be as it is, is a form of metta, of goodwill. when we can touch into that happiness of that goodwill, we can appreciate its pleasantness and its liberation, its flavor of liberation from ill will. So we'll continue in silence for a few more minutes, finding your own way to connect maybe wordlessly now with this attitude of goodwill towards our own experience.
So thanks for being here. We've got a few friends here in the room and thanks for being on Zoom. Um, I thought it might be nice if anyone has any thoughts on the meditation, um, just because metta meditation is kind of its own realm and, and metta is contagious. So if people have any thoughts on that, and, and there's a lot of different ways to practice metta meditation. So if anyone has any comments on how that was for you or any questions about uh, that approach, um, yeah, I just thought I'd open it up to see if anyone had anything to say. Any, any thoughts on uh, that, med that meditation? Yeah, I can, I can try to summarize that. <laughs> um, Jessica was sharing that uh, she's been doing a lot of metta for the self and um, she was able to feel connected to the earth uh, in this meditation. And um, yeah, and, and, and there was a sense of spaciousness too and stillness, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's amazing what that you know experience of of metta of goodwill what it allows. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's yeah. There's just this deep thirst that we have for it, and when we get it, even you know from ourselves, you know, or just that yeah that feeling of touching into our heart's own goodness, it's kind of like we found what we're looking for and we kind of relax. And I think I heard that and what you were saying too, just like the settledness um, that then allows, you know, that relaxation and then allows the heart to open and connect. Whereas, you know, when the heart doesn't feel that connection to metta, we can kind of be kind of desperate and kind of, you know, agitated uh, in contrast. So beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Any other experiences or questions from that meditation? Yeah, I, uh, I have struggled with metta, or I, I would say I did struggle with metta meditation for, um, for a long time in my practice. And I was really, um, it was reading uh, the Venerable Analyo's Satipatthana um, practice guide. And in that, that training, he emphasizes joy as the tipping point in practice that after joy has arisen in the body, kind of the rest of the path will unfold lawfully. And that really inspired my interest in a different way in, in Metta and, and I would say the paramis more broadly also um, because of what you were pointing at tonight that it, it just does feel good. And for so long in my practice, I didn't know or feel like looking for what felt good in the practice was something to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that has really opened a different, um, yeah, a different level of emphasis for me on metta and these other practices that that do inspire a feeling of joy and brightness and and. You know, it's okay for the pleasant to be arising in the practice and to use that as a source of, um, of emphasis. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, really important point. Um, it's so easy for meditation to kind of just get uh, flavored with maybe for a lot of us usual habits of just being critical and because it has that aspect where we're being mindful and we're, but that's one thing I was thinking in the meditation towards the end, like, you know, this perception that we can cultivate that awareness itself, just the awareness that we bring, the mindfulness, you know, what flavor does it have? And why not have it have this flavor of gentleness, of kindness? It just feels better. And I think that's a lot of this practice around metta is just, uh, yeah, just appreciating um, that this, it's not necessarily the habit of the mind to look at ourselves and to look at others in this way. And I think there's 
probably a lot of different reasons for that, but I think, you know, in a simplified version, it's just if the habit of the mind is to be critical, then that's the habit of the mind. And so this is why the Buddha, yeah, encouraged this practice sort of as an ongoing reflection. Like, and it's to me an inspiring thought that we could have, you know, have that as an intention all day long, just, well, checking the attitude of the mind and why not? Is it ever not useful? Is it ever not appropriate? Is it ever not actually pleasant and liberating in a way, liberating from ill will to just be interested? Is, is goodwill possible here? Is that attitude of friendliness, of kindness possible here? And I think a lot of what we learn in that exploration is just we'll see all of our habits of ill will, you know, whether that's fear, whether that's hostility, irritation, self, you know, self-judgment. Um, but then when we see that, we get the chance to, you know, to basically to see it clearly. Oh, this is, this is painful. And to, yeah, have the opportunity to experiment. Well, is it, is it necessary? Is it needed? Um, yeah, any other thoughts on this, um, on the meditation? Anyone from Zoom care to share? Okay, no worries. We'll have some time uh, later for discussion. But I'll share some thoughts on this topic of goodwill. Um, it's been a really important topic in my practice for a long time. Um, and I feel like I just keep yeah, just keep uh, appreciating it more and more. And um, I remember one of the the first meditations I ever did that felt like it uh, had an effect um, was was a metta meditation. I was probably 16 when I was first getting into meditation. And I recognized at the time that my mind was very, very critical. <laughs> and it was, and mostly towards myself. And it was a source of a lot of suffering. And so it just made so much sense. Like, even though, you know, it felt maybe a little uh, contrived or something, but it made so much sense because I knew that this was a deep habit. I could see that to just sit for whatever, 10 minutes and just wish myself well, you know, it felt good. It felt healing. It felt like a healing of a habit, you know, just like, Oh, where did this habit come from? I don't know, but it's here. And, this is something, it was very concrete, like this is something I could do. I could sit there and I could say, may I be happy, may I be well, and I could pay attention to how that felt and, you know, to like connect with that intention of actually meaning that. And, you know, what needed to kind of become clear in order to be able to really connect with that and, and wish that. Um, so yeah, it's been a really, I think just from that initial um, practice and just to see how over time doing metta meditation in particular, you know, specifically doing different forms of metta meditation um, and then also just contemplating it, thinking about it, and then in my daily life, you know, doing my best to, you know, to explore it, how it shows up towards myself, towards others. There's just yeah, a lot more. I think when I first started, I had the idea that I wasn't, I, I wasn't very nice. And maybe that was true in a way, because that was the habit of the mind. And that's part of this is just the malleability of the mind. Um, and, uh, you know, we all just have different conditioning. But yeah, there's just a lot more confidence that this is a capacity of my mind is to wish well, and that it's not just you know, a capacity, but it's, it's a capacity I really want to keep developing. And that is, uh, has so many benefits. It's protective. It protects me from my own ill will and from acting, you know, acting that ill will out in ways that, you know, cause, cause harm. I just remember as just kind of a, a simple example, but, uh, you know, I think before I came across these teachings and was thinking around this, there was just a habit, you know, like with my younger sister, who I love dearly, but of being a little mean sometimes. And I mean, I'm sure we all have our places. 
But yeah, I just remember there was a certain point, you know, again, I was a teenager, but a certain point where it just became clear like that any sort of pleasure that I derived from kind of being a little mean or joking or sarcastic or something, just kind of getting clear that it, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it didn't actually feel good. Um, yeah, maybe there's some, some gratification there, but there's also, yeah, there was something that wasn't being seen clearly. And still, I mean, I think this is just the ongoing process of kind of, um, looking at places where we do have ill will and asking that question and being really interested in that question. Is this, is this in any way really beneficial to myself or to others? And I think that question is really interesting because it, um, yeah, it, it just brings up the question of, well, is ill will necessary in order to take care of ourselves, take care of others, you know, take care of our communities, and even in places where ill will is totally justified, you know, people causing harm, people acting unskillfully, the question is, is ill will helpful in our hearts? Do we need it in order to respond? So yeah, I think a lot of what I've been exploring recently around this topic is just sort of the, yeah, distinguishing what, what really is this quality of metta, of goodwill, and sort of trying to get clear about what is it at its core, and how is it different from, um, from other emotions, other intentions. Like, it's often translated as loving kindness. And um, yeah, I, I'd say just from some of the reading I've done recently, I really prefer the, the term goodwill. Um, and I think it's Tinnisro Bhikkhu makes a strong case, case for that um, translation. And there's another word in Pali, Pema, which could be translated as uh, affection or, or love. And there's an interesting um, teaching in the suttas about how this quality of Pema, which I could I would maybe translate it to as like attached love or just affection, attachment, people we're close to that we like, that we love, um, how this quality of Pema can actually be the basis for ill will because if there's someone that you love and feel close to and somebody else insults them, then you're going to feel ill will towards that person. And I, I think it's just, um, yeah, it's just a helpful distinction. And goodwill is so universal. I mean, it's, uh, that's really the, in my understanding, that's the point of this teaching and, and getting specific around goodwill is that it's different than, than the feelings we have towards people we, we really like or love or are close to. Now, obviously they can overlap. You know, we tend to have goodwill towards the people we're close to, not always, <laughs> um, but it's definitely, um, yeah, I just, I've just been appreciating contemplating this, thinking about this, these different ways that we, yeah, that we feel towards people. And um, yeah, thinking about goodwill and entertaining this possibility that it's, it's always applicable in all relationships. It's always appropriate, you know. I think in our social situations, there's often, at least for me, there can be this you know, just so many different relationships we have in our life with our employers, you know, with friends, with partners, with family. And it's, you know, there's a lot, a lot of different feelings can come up, you know, and all that people we're close to, you know, people we, we don't know very well. And for me, just, just even theoretically, this idea that goodwill is always appropriate has been helpful because it's, I think it's been helpful and it's helped me distinguish or get clear, you know, that, that maybe it's, it's not about, yeah, necessarily even liking someone um, in that way of, you know, having a preference for somebody or, but um, yeah, and it's not even necessarily about, you know, feeling close to someone or, um, 
Yeah, it's really the specific quality of the absence of ill will and the wishing well. And, and is there anyone that we find we couldn't wish well for, you know, wish for their long-term well-being? And maybe there are, but that's then a question, that's there then a, a place for exploration. Because even people that are causing harm, it's not that we like them or we condone what they're doing, but does, do we, does it actually make sense for us to wish that they suffer? Or does it, is it a liberation for our heart to wish that they understand that they're causing harm and, and, you know, and begin acting in ways that are more skillful? Um, yeah, and same with people that we're close to. It can be hard, you know, family or, you know, partners. It, it can be, there can be a lot of uh, attachment in these relationships. And so for me too, it's been helpful you know, like that at, at the basis of any, in my, in my understanding, in my experience, the basis of any kind of relationship, whether it's more, yeah, someone you barely know to someone you're really close to, it seems to me like that the amount of goodwill that's present is really the key for kind of the functionality, the health of that relationship, no matter what, no matter what it is. And I think this can be helpful too in just thinking about what metta is, how we practice it, because I think maybe this is one thing that can turn people off from it is if we think of it as love and that we have to love everyone. And there is this teaching that um, apparently is a mis kind of understanding of this teaching that sometimes is explained that we should love everyone like a mother loves their child. But apparently the correct interpretation of that is we should protect our, our goodwill like a mother would protect her child. Um, because, it, you know, to love everyone the way a mother loves her only child, it might be, yeah, we might find some inspiration in that, but is it really practical, you know, like to have that level of attachment, would that actually make sense? So I like the interpretation that it's protecting our own goodwill because we recognize um, the danger of ill will, you know, how ill will can cause us causes us suffering and can cause us to act unskillfully. So we're really protecting our own heart from its tendencies to fall into ill will. So it's a kind of restraint. It's the restraint. It's the recognizing our mind has the capacity for ill will. And it's recognizing that that's, that that's um, painful. And so it's a, a kind of restraint. And I think a lot of the teachings then make more sense in that regard that it's, um, yeah, it's a form of protecting ourselves. First and foremost, I mean, metta is, is, you know, wishing well for people tends to make people like us and makes our relationships go more smoothly and is just a, a pleasant abiding and a, a cause for harmony. And so it has a lot of benefits. And one of the primary benefits is for our own heart we don't have to experience ill will. I mean, we all, I'm guessing, all know how painful ill will can be. Resentment, you know, when we're holding on to it. Anger, rage, like these can really, you know, we have metaphors like they burn us up. And the Buddha said it's like holding a hot coal in order to throw it at someone else, but we're the ones who get burnt. So a lot of the teachings are sort of, yeah, I think encouraging us to protect our own hearts through goodwill. So there's some, some, I think, interesting, provocative teachings that sort of make this point really strongly, like even if bandits were to capture us and saw our limbs off, that it wouldn't be following the Buddhist teachings to, to regard them with ill will, but rather we should pervade them with the mind of goodwill and outwards and then in all directions. And that's just like... <laughs> It's hard to imagine, and yet I think the point is less, obviously not condoning violence, obviously not saying we shouldn't defend ourselves in situations like that, but I think the point is just making this really strong, um, yeah, this really strong point that like we, we could value our own heart's capacity for being free from ill will, and that the beauty of that, the protection of that, the happiness of that, we could value that 
so much that we're um, we're just getting really clear about you know how how that's a beautiful capacity and that um, yeah does it actually make sense you know if if that really was the situation and there was nothing we could do how do we how would we want to go out with a mind that's raging and or with the mind that you know in some way has this understanding of wishing everyone well even people you know so deluded so disconnected that they could do such violence and this isn't just um theoretical there's actually a teacher that um ajahn suchito who's uh, who's uh, i've studied with a couple times and this basically happened to him <laughs> and he was doing a pilgrimage in india on foot with a friend and they were in some areas where there's kind of bandits in the forest and people yeah they came upon them you know recognized them as westerners thought they might have valuables or something and they had knives and you know they were captured basically and the the lay person who Ajahn Suchito was with was basically kind of resisting and Ajahn Suchito apparently just kind of recognized you know yeah this might this might be it and how do I want to go out you know with a mind of fear and resentment and anger or you know kind of just coming to the present moment and so he like bowed his head and said kind of he indicated with his hand you know if you're going to kill me kind of just do it straight through my head <laughs> and apparently that just totally you know stopped the people in their tracks and they they let them go so that absence of ill will you know even in a situation where obviously on a conventional level totally justified but the question does it actually help you know even on a practical level does it actually you know it ill will tends to lead to more ill will you know if you're resisting you know it's people are going to be more aggressive generally so obviously there's a lot of nuance here and you know it's not doesn't tell us what to do in every situation i think it's obviously more of a simile and kind of meant to be an extreme example but i find it inspiring just because it it to me it, it just invokes or provokes this curiosity in all the situations in my life where i would totally maybe be justified in ill will or conventionally be justified with ill will but then to really ask not for necessarily even the other person's sake but for my own sake like is there a way to be free from this ill will and still take care of myself still be skillful there's a, uh, a little teaching that I like that I think makes this point um, just about snakes. I don't remember the whole story, but basically the phrase is wishing the snakes well. May the snakes be well. So I, I guess the monastics were practicing near some snakes. And um, yeah, I don't remember the whole story, but basically the phrase is of may the snakes be well, may the snakes depart. <laughs> so yeah. And I like that because it, for me, it's, make, it's clarifying that point that goodwill doesn't mean we want to be close to some, someone necessarily. It's just that absence of ill will. If, some, you know, if with a snake or with a person, if what's in our best interest is to not spend time together, then that's our expression of goodwill. You know, maybe, maybe, may we be well and may we, you know, may the snakes depart or may, you know, may we be well, but, you know, not not interacting. Um, Ajahn Suchito, this teacher I just mentioned, has a book on the parami, which I've been reading and drawing from in these talks. And I like this point that he made, which I think I've been exploring in my own practice, but I think he, he, um, he talks about it in a really clear way. He says, metta isn't just an absence of ill will, but also an absence of our pro projections and attachments towards others. Allowing people to be as they are is a really, in my experience, a really beautiful form of, of goodwill. And I just appreciated that point because I, I think, again, this is sort of the distinction between goodwill and um, attachment yeah, because when we're attached to people, we tend to, you know, take them personally and have opinions about how they should be. 
And we can think that that's goodwill or, um, yeah, even, even really liking someone or being, yeah, fascinated by them, attached to them. You know, we can feel how that's a bit of an imposition. Um, it's different from just this goodwill that's sort of an open, an open hand. May you be well, whatever that looks like. I forget who, who it was who said this thing about friendship, like the best kind of friendship or something, or the kind of friendship I want to have is the friendship that wishes my friend well, even if what they prefer is spending time with someone else. And um, yeah, I think there's something profound there about, yeah, about this distinction. I'll read a little bit more about what he says on this topic. He says, we don't have to make people the same as ourselves or judge ourselves based on what we think about other people. We don't have to feel we have to win them over or feel that they should satisfy our emotional hunger. And when metta is fully developed, it can allow us to be with the irritating and the unfair and the messy so that such perceptions no longer even take hold. When we consider otherness, the way beings are different from us, we can feel either insecurity, how does she compare with me, or contempt, you're not as good as me, or fear and, and intimidation, you're better or stronger than me, or we can feel adoration slash attraction, I want to be bonded to you. These immediate assumptions are called conceit, that is, we conceive of people as worse, better, or the same of us. The effect is that the mind's responsiveness gets stuck. It doesn't see the rich or successful with compassion for their suffering. It doesn't value the beauty, humor, or resilience of those worse than me. And it doesn't respect the differences of those who are the same as me. Caught in the conceit of self-view, the heart doesn't extend its boundaries of appreciation and concern. We take each other for granted as my wife, my boss, my teacher, and that fixing of them freezes our sensitivity. In that state, the heart easily tips over into complaining about the other not being the way they should be, or rather the way I want them to be, and so the heart becomes a breeding ground for ill will. So I, I just appreciate this. Um, yeah, again, just kind of with this exploration for me about this a hypothesis that goodwill is always applicable and helpful and appropriate in all the variety of relationships that we have and um, that maybe it's the most satisfying kind of connection that we can have with others and obviously it can look different you know with someone we don't know it's maybe just like yeah wishing well and then with someone that we're close to it you know it's it's caring for them it's showing up for them you know um, but yeah, but just also looking at how when we, when we kind of freeze people into a solid definition and you know, have expectations, it tends to lead to ill will because people don't always meet our expectations. So that, like I think, in, especially in close relationships, there's always gonna be, yeah, this, this kind of um, mix of intentions of <clears throat> trying to get our needs met, which we do as, you know, as social be beings, and in moments, you know, this ability that we have of just wishing well, wishing what's best, and just that ability to kind of recognize these different, um, yeah, these different tendencies of our mind, I think, for me is, yeah, just an ongoing exploration, like what, you know, what do I really trust in terms of my intentions and in showing up with people and then how that actually gets expressed in the different kinds of relationships. Like what does goodwill look like, you know, with a close friend or a partner is really different than with, you know, with a family member. But that kind of creativity in a way of being open to that possibility, like, no, this is really what I trust. I mean, as a basis, you know, as kind of the foundation for everything else, it, I trust a, a heart of goodwill, a heart that wishes well, that can connect with others and not just see them as an extension of myself, not just see them as, you know, alien to myself, but to care about them kind of in their own right as their own person. I mean, I think that's really one of the most beautiful things that we can experience is that sense that somebody sees us, appreciates us, wishes us well, or that we do that for someone else. 
But it's tricky because we have so much conditioning either around fear or around attachment, like Ajahn Suchitta was describing. So for me, it's you know not expecting perfection, but just this um, yeah, this interest um, in this capacity of our heart to show up in that way that really feels good, and how that can be expressed in in different situations. Um, he makes this point, Ajahn Suchitta, too, about goodwill um, requiring some measure of well-being. And I thought that was really um, a good point. And I think in some ways it's related maybe to what you were sharing, Jessica, like how we, it's really what we, we want, this sense of well-being. And then when we have that, it's so much easier, you know, to wish well. If we're feeling totally stressed and in survival mode, we're not going to have a lot of capacity to to wish well. We're just kind of in that, yeah, in that more animal mode of kind of fight or flight survival. So this kind of maybe is a bit of a recap or a coming back to, well, where do we get that measure of well-being where then we, we feel like we have something to offer to ourselves, to others? And... Um, one answer is that it's from these, you know, these other parami that really give us a sense, a basic sense of self-respect, you know, that we're doing our best, we're valuing generosity, so not just kind of looking out for ourselves, but extending ourselves where, where possible. And sila, this, this interest, this commitment to non-harming, this sensitivity around our actions, you know, just how much better we feel about ourselves if we feel like we're doing our best to be careful to not cause harm than if we're being careless and renunciation which is sort of this modesty or contentment like you know uh, an, a, a, a wisdom that maybe our deepest happiness isn't just going to come from gratification but you know what can we learn from simplifying from letting go and then using that energy that we might otherwise spend just pursuing sensual pleasure you know, to be interested in the mind and heart. Well, what's, what's going on here? So these are the first three parami in this list of 10. Maybe I'll just read a little what Ajahn Suchitta says about this. He says, the first three perfections, generosity, morality, and renunciation, make well-being possible because when one is gener generous and virtuous, there's self-respect. Because of that good karma, we have emotional brightness in which the mind can extend itself to other beings in empathic rather than grasping ways. Hence, we get full, fuller and richer in ourselves and can let go of a few more prompts, or not prompts, props. As the fear and the need disappear, discernment gets clearer and we can see where we need to work. This means we begin to recognize where fearful self-defensive boundaries occur in our lives Beyond these boundaries, we collapse or get incoherent, and in maintaining them, we contract or get volcanic. But with the parami, we see what affects us at the edge of our sense of self, and then we find the energy to work into that sensitive place. Patience is essential because sometimes it can take a long time staying at the edges before things shift. Truthfulness is required to acknowledge this turbulence, this sense of intimidation, is not him, her, them, or me. It's actually that affect and response. So it is. Often in our lives, we find ourselves going through the same emotional scenarios and the same wounded, dumped-on experiences, just with different characters doing the dumping or irritating. First you assume it's him or her. Then you might think it's me. It's my weakness. But is this really true? You can spend ages attributing causes anywhere you choose along the self-other boundary, but that doesn't release the pain. Instead, you need the resolve to stay with it to get to the truth behind the self-view. As you let go of all the discriminations and positions, your mind widens to include it all. This is where the latent tendency that is holding the self-other boundary gets released. I really appreciated that last part, um, you know, that blaming doesn't resolve, whether it's blaming ourselves or blaming someone else, it doesn't resolve that pain of, you know, that ill will, whether it's the ill will of fear, intimidation, or the ill will of, blaming someone else or blaming ourselves. You know, as long as the mind basically is believing that story of that ill will is going to take care of me, 
which is an understandable story. And it's, it's just a defense mechanism that we, most people have on, you know, different flavors of it. But, you know, this is a way to protect myself, to hold myself apart, to hold others at, apart, as if we could actually kind of wall ourselves off when the truth is we're kind of an open system and we're sensitive and we feel. And that's hard. <laughs> but, you know, in a way, I think goodwill replaces ill will as a defense, as a protection. Um, in my experience, ill will can feel like a protection, but it's actually, it's actually a brittleness and it's actually this bracing where we're already tense, we're already tight, and we're already sort of primed for conflict and for kind of othering and pushing each other, pushing others out or pushing ourselves out. And the Buddha uh, explicitly taught goodwill as a protection. You know, there is a story of monastics practicing near some, some um, forest spirits that were making strange noises and emitting strange smells, <laughs> unpleasant smells. And the monastic said, we can't practice here and, and went to the Buddha and the Buddha encouraged them to wish well, to go into that place where there was unpleasantness, but wishing well towards, towards these beings. And apparently the beings like that, which beings tend to do and, and stopped making those unpleasant sounds and smells and instead maybe blessed the monastics. I don't remember all the details, but, and you know, we hear stories like this. We hear stories of the transformative power of goodwill, even when it's, you know, meeting ill will. And this is really kind of, yeah, where forgiveness takes place, where healing takes place. And it's simple, it's simple to talk about, but I think like what Ajahn Suchitta was saying is that we, it, it does take some resolution uh, and it takes some interest and it takes some confidence, some faith, maybe borrowed faith at first, but I think partly what it, where it comes from is just if we, if we do find ourselves in situations where we're kind of just hitting our heads against the wall, where we just recognize there's a lot of ill will here and it really hurts. It's really painful. It's like out of desperation, then we, we consider, you know, what, what would it look like to let that go? What would goodwill look like? And yeah, like he says, it's, it's not even that, yeah, we find, um, you know, it's like, yeah, we are imperfect. Other people aren't perfect. We do cause harm. Other people cause harm. But it's this, um, this widening goodwill that widens, that widens to include that and just is answering that question. Well, yeah. And still, at the end of the day, what's in the best interest, you know, what, what supports well-being for myself and others? He makes other points, I didn't write this down, but around that boundaries are totally appropriate and like they just exist. It's just the truth. Like we, you know, that otherness, he's making the point out. It's not about, which I think there can be a misunderstanding, merging into like a blob of different, undifferentiated love. And at times, you know, our own hearts can feel that way because like, there's no, we're not creating divisions and ill will. But in the terms of, you know, conventional reality, it's still, there's someone else there. And it's a form of respect, you know, to understand that that's somebody else with their own mind, not just an extension of ourselves. So we're, yeah, what it is, you know, in terms of other people is looking at them I think it's said, you know, we look at them as similar to us in, in the sense that they also want to be happy, just like we want to be happy, they want to be happy. And that's kind of the core thing we have in common. So it, it just makes sense then to, even if we don't, yeah, again, agree with everything they do, but we recognize most people are just doing the best they can. And uh, we share this reality. And so it's kind of, it's self-interested to have goodwill because it just, yeah, it makes, makes our relationships go more smoothly. I think I've shared this maybe in this group before, but working here at Common Ground, interacting with a lot of different people, 
having a lot of different details to take care of. Um, and again, just kind of coming, having the conditioning of having a critical mind. Yeah, I think I just learned through experience, like if I'm gonna show up with, with irritation or impatience, especially at a meditation center where people are sensitive, like that's gonna have effects and it's gonna make my job harder. <laughs> so even just for my own well-being, it just made a lot of sense. And it didn't feel like a, a faking or anything, a, a forcing, but just to incline the mind that, that that's a possibility as kind of a default to regard people, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt, regard them with goodwill, and it actually feels good. It actually, um, and yeah, and then people tend to respond. People tend to respond in kind. This is, I think, one of the one of the the joys of life. One of, you know, in this world where there's so much that's uncertain, you know, so much we can't control, but we can sort of recognize our commonality and not add, you know, additional competitiveness and ill will and conflict and hostility to that. And this is one of the, I think, one of the trustworthy and, um, you know, we can't, it's not guaranteed, but we can start appreciating how healing it is in our own hearts and do our best to show up in that way and you know then we find that these moments and uh, this capacity that makes life easier it just makes life so much easier and um, more pleasant and um, yeah it just feels in a way like fulfilling human potential this which is and it's very basic on a level you know it's that again it doesn't have to be exuberant love but just that we have the ability to get along to some degree and to wish well and to not just be kind of in our own world. That happiness of goodwill, I'm sure we all recognize how, how beautiful it is. And this is why the Buddha taught it and, and talked about it in lofty terms as a divine abiding, um, as immeasurable. I think it's immeasurable because of its that breadth of application where we're just seeing, we're, we're questioning, we're exploring, maybe this could, could be the default of the mind, regardless of all the imperfections of life, of other people, of myself, job, responsibility, things I have to do, all the things that make life irritating, that make life difficult, and yet the mind could have this capacity to, to be trained in this way, to be reminded that it feels better to, to wish well. Uh, maybe I'll end by reading a, a poem that you may have heard before that I think summarizes a lot of this called Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. <clears throat> before you know what kindness really is, <clears throat> you must lose things, feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. So maybe we'll just leave uh, my comments there. Thanks for listening. Appreciate your kind attention.
And we do have some time left, so I'll just open it up. If people have comments from your own practice of goodwill in your daily life and in, in formal practice, what you're learning, places that feel maybe, yeah, difficult to have goodwill and how you're exploring that. Um, any questions from anything I've shared? Um, yeah. So the, you all heard the question? Conceit. Um, yeah, I liked how Ajahn Suchitta was talking about it in this um, in this chapter. Um, but basically, it's any uh, any form of conceiving, really, of others. Um, and it's just that it's just that tendency we have, that very deep tendency we have to compare ourselves with others. And it's either better, worse, or equal. Those are kind of the three options. But the, the teaching is sort of that that is always unsatisfying and stressful. You know, even if we think people are the same, kind of like Ajahn Suchitta was saying, you think someone's the same as you, and then you're disappointed when you realize they're not, because no one's exactly the same as you. You know, you have some difference of opinion or something, and like, oh, my, my best friend likes a different kind of movie than I do, and then you feel a little, yeah. Um, or you just don't respect the differences, you know, if you think someone's the same as you, kind of like what he's saying, you're not respecting their otherness and letting them be who they are. And then obviously, you know, you think someone is better than you, that makes you feel bad, you think you're better than someone else, that might seem like a good one. <laughs> but, you know, then things change, you know, or, you know, there's just, yeah, there's kind of contempt in there, which doesn't feel good either, even if, you know, when we're more clear about it. And to me, this is a really interesting teaching. I think Ajahn Sumedho said something at one point, like that in his experience, any way of kind of thinking of himself when he had some thought of himself, that there was always suffering there. And so this kind of gets to the teaching around, um, yeah, kind of self and what we do with that. But I think in particular with conceit, it can be a little clear because we're not only are we assuming that there's this thing called me that's somehow, you know, really solid, but then we're comparing it to somebody else who we're also saying, oh, yeah, I know who that person is. And we're making some judgment, like some eternal judgment. Yeah, I'm better than them. I'm worse than them. Or we're the same. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think ap apparently this is one of the last, I forget if it is the last, you know, Alex? It's the last of the fetters, 10 fetters, right? Yeah. So like um, there's this list of fetters that get uprooted through the progressive stages of awakening. Um, it's an interesting list. I don't have it all memorized, but um, I think the first three are like attachment to um, rites and rituals or uh, customs and conventions, you know, just thinking like that some ritual, like, you know, that we have, it doesn't even have to be religious, but just like every Tuesday I do this and this is gonna save me on some ultimate level. Um, and self view is one of the first ones too, which is kind of a more philosophical view that like, yeah, this is who I am. You know, like I am an eternal soul and after death I will go to heaven if I'm good. You know, and having that strong philosophical view, that one also is uprooted. And um, do you remember the other one? Doubt, right, yes, Skepti skeptical doubt, like just kind of, um, yeah, a more kind of, well, who knows kind of thing. And there's some sense of like, no, there is a path. Yeah, so anyways, those are the first three. Then there's like sense desire and ill will get kind of weakened, and then eventually they get uprooted. But I think, like, like Alex is uh, helping me remember, that conceit is the last one. So it just goes to show like how powerful and deep this conditioning is, like even after, yeah, self-view where we're not really, you know, we don't really think, yeah, have a strong philosophical view, but just that, yeah, you know, I feel like probably just speculating one of the reasons is we're just such social animals as human beings. We're just primed, you know, evolutionarily to be always kind of measuring ourselves and comparing ourselves to others. So I think it's, you know, again, I think to remember that it's that idea that it's one of the last to be uprooted is just to give ourselves a lot of patience and 
kindness as we notice our mind doing this all the time. And that maybe on some level, you know, there's something, you know, we do need to assess people and we need, do need to assess ourselves. Like there's nothing wrong with that discernment. But I think the teaching is just getting clear about suffering that's present when we take that really seriously, when we really do think, oh yeah, someone's better than me or I'm better than someone else, or even that, you know, we're the same. And um, that means something that I can really rely on. So it's just that, um, yeah, that tendency to conceive of others in a kind of permanent solid way. And do we need to do that in order to engage skillfully with, with each other? Or could it be something a little more open and free and like in the moment? Because we're always changing, right? You know, some days we're more pleasant than others, more happy, more sad, more goodwill, less goodwill, and same with others. And like, does goodwill as kind of a, a basic operating mode, maybe that is all we need in a way. Like, we just need to wish well. We don't we even need to know, define someone because people change. We can just wish them well as they are here and now. And like, how does that show up given how I am right now, given how they are right now? I think it does help. I think when, I think we get into trouble when we, when we crystallize people and like, even though it's inevitable, like we will do that. But in my experience, you know, moments, yeah, where there's a lot of connection and there's less of that sense because there's, because that gets in the way of really like showing up and listening and having that, that goodwill. And there's more of a sense of, we don't know who we are. We don't know who they are. We're kind of, but we're, but the goodwill is what helps us kind of, well, we, we know that we care. And so we're willing to kind of be there, be there really in the, in a fresh way. That's my take on that. Yeah. I like this idea of it being really like deep rooted and yeah. the solution just being just be really kinder to yourself. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Jessica was just saying that she appreciates the, the thought that it's very deep rooted. And so we, the idea to be kind with ourselves around it, totally, totally. Cause it is so painful you know, that, that tendency to compare ourselves. So definitely. Any other thoughts in the remaining couple minutes? I'm kind of just sitting a little bit in a field of goodwill. I mean, this is one of the things about metta, like we can talk a lot about it, but you know, what we really want is that, that feeling. And any, I think like, I think there's one teaching I didn't read about the Buddha saying, like, it's so valuable that there's this image like of somebody getting down on their hands and knees and lapping water out of a cow's footprint, like, so sort of like just the um, desperation in a way, like if you were really thirsty and you needed water, like you would, you know, you would get down and lap it from a, a cow's footprint, even though that's kind of, um, yeah, I don't know, unsanitary <laughs> or, or whatever. But yeah, it's just a lot of these teachings, I think they're pointing to like really valuing this quality. And so then like, for me, it's sort of like, whenever there's a scent of it, whenever I remember that it's you know, possible, I remember to even check it out. It's, yeah, there is this sense of like a real devotion in a way or like, or even desperation or like for dear life, like protecting it, you know, like that mother, e even like the most nascent sort of whiff of it, like, oh yeah, there's some appreciation here. And kind of, uh, yeah, getting to know that because, yeah, I think it, in this world where there is danger, I think it is one of our most reliable protections. It doesn't protect us, obviously, from everything. Although there is a teaching that says it protects us from poison and poison, weapon, and fire will not harm you. So there you go. Maybe I'll just end by reading this um, list. It's a famous teaching, the 11 benefits to practicing metta. You will sleep easily you will wake easily, 
You will have pleasant dreams. People will love you. Devas, gods, which are gods or angels, and animals will love you. Devas will protect you. External dangers such as poisons, weapons, and fire will not harm you. Your face will be radiant. Your mind will be serene. You will die unconfused. You will be reborn in happy realms. So this is motivation, not for, yeah, pretending anything, but just to recognize the truth that our hearts do have this capacity and it's beautiful and it's pleasant and kind of like Alex was saying, that's not something we need to be shy about or afraid of. And I think it, it is like for some of us, like I was saying for me when I started, we can have these self views like, oh, I'm not a kind person, but that's just a view. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, like, and I don't think it's about replacing it necessarily with another view, although that, you know, if we have that view, we could have the view that, yeah, no, there, I am a kind person, and that would be a more helpful view. Um, and that, you know, obviously the truth is we have capacity for both, and that's why, you know, we can encourage this. We can reflect that this is something we can do. We can reflect on, we can get to know it, we can kind of keep an eye out for it and appreciate it. And I think it's that appreciating that, Again, not as like a personal attribute necessary, but something that, yeah, we can appreciate um, is what strengthens it. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Appreciate, appreciate your comments. So yeah, you're welcome to join for the last session, number 10 on equanimity in a couple weeks, June 8. And then this group will stop meeting for a while. But I appreciate everyone's being here. Have a good night.